three, two, 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 two. <laughs> two, 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 one, zero. Okay, so this is September 3rd, and this is the afternoon session starting at 3.30 p.m. Okay, so we are ready to resume, and we are resuming with still in the factors present in the wholesome, first wholesome state of consciousness. Okay, so now we come to a factor which the Pali word is chanda, which I would translate this as desire. Venerable Jnana Moli used zeal, which I don't particularly like. You, know, you have a zeal for your cause, ready to die for your cause. But this is simply a desire, explained as the desire to act. So the word chanda is actually used in the text in several ways in the Nikayas. Sometimes it's used almost as a synonym for craving. So that is desire, you say, in the negative way. But then the word chanda is also used in the positive sense. For example, in the explanation of right effort, we have the desire to prevent the arising of unarisen, unwholesome states, the desire to eliminate arisen, unwholesome states, the desire to bring forth unarisen, wholesome states, and the desire to bring to maturity the arisen, wholesome states. So desire there is being used in the positive sense of the desire for good, or the desire to reach the goal. But then desire is also used in what we might call a kind of neutral sense as simply the desire to undertake any kind of action. And so this is explained as the, having the characteristic of desire to act. It is manifested as the need for an object and it should be regarded as the extending of the mental hand in the apprehending of an object. So this is present, it's said, in most states of consciousness. So most states of consciousness, with a few exceptions, have this desire to act. Okay, the next factor, the Pali word is adimoka. Venerable Nyanamoli translated it as resolution. Some alternatives could be decision, decisiveness. And this has the characteristic of conviction, and it's manifested as decisiveness. This was the factor that I mentioned just before when my teacher was back in the 1970s, was teaching me the Abhidhamma, <laughs> when he said <laughs> that for the Buddhists, their belief in the Buddha Dharma is sada faith, but he said for the followers of the other religions, what they have is their belief in their tenets and their God, that is adimoka, conviction. Okay, the next mental factor here is called manasikara. And this is translated as attention. And here attention, this has to be understood carefully, that this attention is not, or as manasikara, is not the sustained attention to an object. 
That would be probably sustained attention, would be probably coming through the collaboration of a number of mental factors like applied thought, sustained thought, one-pointedness, mindfulness. But this is what's meant by manasikara is the attention in the sense of the turning of the mind to an object, an object that has not yet been present in the mind. So, for example, if I hear a loud sound to my left, then I turn in this direction to see what's going on. So that is what brings about that turning of my head to the left, the, the thing that captures my attention, or, or the, f the, f the mental factor that causes me to turn in this direction, that is attention. That is, that my mind has been flowing with one object concerned with one particular thing, suddenly something else intervenes and I turn to the new object. So that is attention. So it's said, it makes the mind different from the previous mind, thus it is attention. Nyanamoli put in life continuum here, but I don't think that's really necessary. So when the mind is focused on one thing and then one turns it to something else, that turning of the attention to the new object, that is manasikara. And then the Visuddhi Magga men mentions three aspects of attention, but the one that we are actually concerned with here is what it explains as the controller of the object. And this has the characteristic of conducting. That is, it conducts the mind and all of the other mental factors to the new object. And its function, it said, is to yoke the associated states to the object. So the associated states are all of the other mental factors arising along with attention. So through attention, the mind turns to the new object and it yokes all of the associated factors to that new object. And so again, it's manifested as confrontation with the object that is facing the new object directly. And it's so to be regarded as the conductor the word sarati is actually a chariot driver. And so this mental factor is like the chariot driver directs the chariot to a particular destination. So this mental factor of attention directs all of the other mental factors to the new object. And this mental factor of attention is also considered one of the universal mental factors present in every state of mind. Because every state of mind is directed to a particular object. And so what turns the mind to that object is this factor of manasikara. Okay, now we come to the mental factor, which is called, Nyanamoli uses a rather complicated expression, specific neutrality. The Pali word, tatra majatatta, comes from tatra, which means there. And then majata means middle, and the ta ending is something like ness. So this is like middleness, middleness there. And so literally, he says, it's neutrality in regard thereto. So we could simply call this mental neutrality, neutrality of mind. And this factor of specific neutrality 
is equanimity in the higher contemplative sense rather than equanimity simply as neutral feeling. So this is equanimity as balance of mind, the mind which veers neither towards pleasant objects, painful objects, or the mind which is attracted, which, which is not upset by gain and loss, fame and obscurity, praise and blame, pleasure and pain. And it's also the factor that's responsible for equanimity or impartiality in regard to other people. So it's through this specific neutrality that one is able to, <coughs> to look at other people or other beings with an equal mind, not favoring some and dismissing or denigrating others, but one looks at others, at all of them equally. <clears throat> and among the four divine abodes or sublime states, one of the four divine, the fourth of the four divine abodes is equanimity. So this is the main factor that's responsible for the emergence of that kind of equanimity. And this mental factor is also responsible in the development of the seven factors of enlightenment. So it's most responsible for, it's the main factor in the seventh factor of enlightenment, the factor of equanimity. It's okay, don't worry about it. Okay, now we come to two beautiful mental factors that also enter into the divine abodes. These are compassion, and here Nyanamoli is translated as gladness, I would use altruistic joy. Some translators use sympathetic joy, appreciative joy. So compassion is that mental factor that's responsible for one sort of feeling empathy with those who are undergoing suffering. It's said to be the quality that makes the heart of a good person shake with the suffering of others. And then gladness or altruistic joy is the factor that's responsible for one rejoicing in the good fortune of others or in the good qualities of others. And these are said to be, compassion and gladness are said to be inconstant factors because they might be present in a beautiful state of consciousness or they might not be present. And if they are present, they won't be present simultaneously. If one directs the mind to the suffering of others, then compassion will arise. And because the object of that particular state of mind are beings who are undergoing suffering, then the appropriate response, the necessary response, is compassion. <coughs> Whereas, when one directs one's mind to the good fortune or good qualities of others, then the object is different, not the suffering of beings. So in that case, one will experience joy or gladness at the good fortune of others. And so those two, compassion and altruistic joy are first they're not present constantly but they become present only when one directs the mind either to those who are suffering or those who are in good fortune and then they are not present simultaneously <clears throat> and now if you look at these you see okay you've included compassion you've included gladness or altruistic joy 
where are the other two divine abodes, loving kindness and equanimity? I already explained that equanimity develops out of this specific neutrality. But what about metta that we practice every night? Where is that amongst the mental factors? And this is, I find, rather strange. But again, this is the way the elders, the ancients compiled the Abhidhamma. So they say that loving kindness is a mode or manifestation of non-hatred. Again, this seems strange to me because, okay, non-hatred is, I say it's not just the absence of hatred, but it's what's responsible for removing hatred. But, okay, let us say I'm speaking on Dhamma and you're listening to Dhamma. So these are wholesome states of consciousness, right? And so non-greed is present in these wholesome states of consciousness, non-hatred is present, and yet, though there's no non-hatred in those states of consciousness, but the state of consciousness is quite different from if one is developing, consciously developing loving-kindness. It seems that developing loving-kindness has such a distinctive flavor of its own that I don't see how you could simply subordinate it to non-hatred and say it's an aspect of non-hatred. So if I were present at these early councils when the elders are compiling <laughs> the Abhidhamma, I would say, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> Aren't you just being a little too simplistic? <laughs> okay, so I would add loving-kindness as a separate a mental factor. And then also, I mean, there are quite a lot of mental factors that we encounter and experience, wholesome mental factors that seem to be missing from this list. Like, okay, just to mention one is patience. So we would say, somebody would say, okay, patience, also Bodhi, that's an aspect of non-hatred. But I would say, Hold on now. When I am trying to be patient, I really experience that as having very different flavor from the non-hatred that might be present, say, if I'm bowing down to the Buddha and generating a mind of veneration. In that case, I would say, okay, there's non-hatred there in that this state of mind has this beautiful root in which hatred is absent. But that's very different from being patient under provocation. And so there seem to be like many other mental states that could have, or mental factors, that could have been included in the Abhidhamma scheme that somehow they just didn't make, make it. Then a, another mental state not included here is fear. Very strange, since fear is mentioned so often in the suttas, both the unwholesome type of fear that comes from change and impermanence, and then the wholesome type, which is, well, well we all have the moral dread as one kind of fear. That is included. But the fear that arises from reflecting on the dangers of samsara, yet not included. Years ago, I had asked, there was a Burmese Abhidhamma master living in the United States, U Silananda, who had had a Buddhist center in San Francisco. And I had asked him, why is fear not included in the Abhidhamma? And he said, fear is an aspect of dosa, of hatred. But it seems to me that there's such concrete, discernible differences between aversion or hatred and fear, that fear should have become a distinct factor, but it's not there. Okay, we have to continue. Okay, now we come to a group of three 
beautiful mental factors which are called the abstinences. And so these three abstinences are mentioned in the Noble Eightfold Path as right speech, right action, right livelihood. And so the three abstinences becomes the ab become the abstinence from verbal misconduct, the abstinence from bodily misconduct, and the abstinence from wrong livelihood. So here we have, the first is kaya du charita virati. The word virati means abstaining. When you take the precept, you use the word veramani. So veramani and virati are pretty much the same word in different forms. So these three have the characteristic of non-transgression in the respective fields of bodily conduct, verbal conduct, and livelihood. Or else they have the characteristic of not treading there, not overstepping the bounds into wrong conduct of speech, body, and livelihood. And their function is to draw back from the fields of bodily misconduct, verbal misconduct, and wrong livelihood. And it's said that these three factors in the wholesome sense sphere, they arise only in the wholesome sense sphere consciousness, they don't arise, or I should say, in the mundane types of consciousness, they arise only in the sense sphere wholesome consciousness. They don't arise in the fine material sphere consciousness or in the immaterial sphere consciousness. And in the sense sphere consciousness, they arise only on a specific occasion when one is deliberately abstaining from some type of verbal misconduct. For example, I'm, an embarrassing I'm in an embarrassing situation and I'm tempted to tell a falsehood, but then I remember that I've undertaken a precept to abstain from false speech, so I don't utter that falsehood, I speak truthfully. So that abstaining from the false speech, that is being exercised by this particular mental factor of abstaining from verbal misconduct. Or I see some maybe mosquitoes come into my room and buzzing around and disturbing my sleep. So I might get angry at them and be tempted to slap them, kill them. And then I remember I've taken the precept not to destroy life, and so I abstain from that bodily misconduct. Or somebody might be persuaded to, you know, you want to make a few extra bucks, you take this package of white powder, and you go and you into the neighborhood, and you start selling it in little packets, you make quite a lot of good money. And then one remembers, I'm following the Eightfold Path, so I want to observe right livelihood, and so one avoids that wrong livelihood. And so this is the abstinence from wrong livelihood. <laughs> and so <laughs> it seems a little bit quaint that the restraining from these three types of misconduct is seen to be the function of particular mental factors in the constellation of consciousness. And that is in ordinary sense fair consciousness, but on the occasion of the four supermundane paths, it's said that all three kinds of abstinence arise simultaneously, each one destroying the tendency or the disposition of the mind towards the corresponding types of misconduct. 
And so that is because it said that in those super mundane states of consciousness, the prevalent factors are the eight factors of the noble path. So that is the world transcending noble eightfold path. And that noble path has right speech, right action, right livelihood. So those have to be then identified with particular mental factors. Okay, so these are the 36 mental formations that should be understood to be associated with the first wholesome consciousness of the sense sphere. Okay, then it's going into the types of mental formations that are associated with the other types of wholesome consciousness. Let us just finish through the sense sphere, then I'll leave the rest for later. Okay, with the second, the second, the only difference is that the second one, well, the second is the same as the first, except that the first is spontaneous, the second is prompted. But in both, it's said here, the mental factors are all the same. Okay, the third, in the third, the mental factors are all the same, except this state of consciousness is disconnected from knowledge. And knowledge is the same as non-delusion. And so this state of consciousness doesn't have that wholesome root or beautiful root of non-delusion. And also the fourth, which is the same, vir virtually the same, except that it's prompted, also lacks the root of non-delusion. So these are the two wholesome sense fair consciousnesses connected with joy, but disconnected from knowledge. Okay, then the next four are in place of joy as the feeling, we have the neutral feeling or equanimity. And so because joy is absent, the mental factor of PT will also be absent. So that is absent in all four of these. except the first two of these are associated with knowledge, and so they have the root of non-delusion, and the second two are disconnected from knowledge, and so they lack the root of non-delusion. And so that takes us through the mental formations present in the eight kinds of wholesome sense fear consciousness. And so let us now, and I'm rather getting a little tired of explaining things, so let us use the rest of this period for taking questions. And before I take questions from the floor, we have some questions coming from Venerable Ji Shu who wrote them down and they've been translated into English. Okay, so she has three questions. So the first, is the bhavanga like a camera regarding every action we have done? For example, we might randomly recollect something we did yesterday or some incident that happened a long time ago. So I think the question is, is it the bhavanga that stores up those impressions of our experiences and our mental states? Do they get sort of accumulated in the bhavanga? And this question actually raises what seems to me to be a big theoretical problem with the Abhidhamma system. I don't mean that it's sort of... <laughs> undermines the validity of the system in its own right, but it seems to be an area that's not dealt with explicitly, and that is where 
how are the impressions of our actions and our experiences, how are they preserved? How do they come up in memory? Because the bhavanga is somewhat different from the alaya vijnana consciousness of the yogachara system. The bhavanga has only a single object, the same object, and it always occurs, every occasion of the bhavanga occurs with the same object and the same grouping of mental factors. So it doesn't seem to be able to function as a storage of memories of past experiences, at least the way it's explained in the text. And so I think partially in order to address that problem, the later generation of Buddhist philosophers in northern India of the Yogacara school then devised a kind of consciousness that they called the storehouse consciousness, which is said to preserve the impressions of all of our, pa of all of our experiences and to retain the seeds of all of our karmic actions. And then when the conditions ripen, then the storehouse consciousness, those seeds in the storehouse consciousness ripen in the form of the experiences that bring out the results of those karmic seeds. So it seems to me that in order to address that problem, we have to sort of speculate that perhaps in the bhavanga there are different strata, different layers, and so there may be a layer in the bhavanga which is functioning very much like the storehouse consciousness, even though at the surface level the bhavanga consciousness only has one object, which is always remaining the same. And in fact, I believe Asanga, who was one of the founders of the Yogacara school, in one of his works he said, that which the southern Buddhists, that's referring to the Theravada school, call the bhavanga, that we call the storehouse consciousness. Okay, so that is a sort of tentative answer to the first question. The second question, <laughs> if someone loses their memory, does his or her bhavanga get interrupted or lose its functioning? I guess this is asking if somebody loses the memory, like gets amnesia, you know, where one doesn't remember anything, one would have to say that the store, that the bhavanga consciousness is still functioning. How to explain the loss of memory, amnesia, in Abhidhamic terms, I don't know. But the bhavanga consciousness goes on functioning as long as life lasts. If the bhavanga consciousness stops, the life comes to an end. Except, it said in the special meditative attainment called the attainment of cessation. In that attainment, it said the bhavanga is sort of temporarily comes to a stop. So the bhavanga goes off to the, di <laughs> to the dining hall to get a cup of tea, <laughs> and the meditator remains in the state of absorption for the duration of the attainment. Say he wants to be in, a, in cessation for one hour, so one hour there's no bhavanga occurring then because of the past determination or resolution, after one hour, the bhavanga arises again, and then the process of consciousness continues. Okay, so that is question two. Question three, is our life flow part of the function of bhavanga? Actually, I would say the flow of our life is mainly the function of the bhavanga. As I explained several times this morning, that during all the occasions when there's no active consciousness occurring, no cognitive process occurring, then the mind is operating in the mode of bhavanga. Then when something sort of arouses or awakens the active consciousness, 
then the bhavanga temporarily stops, the mind actively cognizes its object till the process is finished, then comes the drop into the bhavanga again. So those are the three questions. Okay, let us go one, two, okay. Well, okay, actually, the woman in behind you, I, I pointed her out first. Okay, please stand up. And Hi. Um, and your name again? Sophie. Sophie, right. Sophie, yes. Um, so on page 473, um, section 148 that's talking about the proficient state of the body and proficiency, proficiency of consciousness. Yeah. And at the end of the segment it says um, they are manifested as absence of disability. Their proximate cause is the, uh, is the body and consciousness. They should be regarded as opposed to faithlessness. Um, I perhaps am misunderstanding, but is this suggesting that disabilities are the karmic result of faithlessness? That the what? That disabilities are the karmic result of faithlessness. The karmic results of? Faithlessness. Faithlessness. Let me just take a look at this passage. The profession state of the mental body. This is not referring to like the disability in the way that word is being used today, but this would be the, let's say, absence of mental proficiency, the inability, say, to deal effectively with the particular objects that one is concerned with. Um, okay, could you perhaps, um, it got us into an interesting conversation over the break. Could you perhaps speak a little bit um, about disabilities and karma and um, the idea of, of disabilities being karmic retribution for past actions? I would say probably the disabilities are the results of past karma. Okay. I know that sounds a little bit like one is blaming the victim, but this is not a matter of blaming anybody, but it's just that when one creates unwholesome karma, that karma has the tendency to produce certain results that are considered normally considered undesirable that inhibit one's effectiveness in various ways. And that is the way it works. It's sort of the consequences of one's own action coming back and bringing forth their results. Um, thank you, Bhante. I'm Nat. Um, why, why is bliss uh, the proximate cause of samadhi? And you know, how does that work? And also, related to that, you mentioned when you have wholesome consciousness, you, have, you have wholesome consciousness, yeah. you have sometimes some samadhi built in there, and you seem to say that if you continue to have wholesome consciousness, yeah. samadhi builds up over time. Could yeah, you yeah. sort of repeat okay. that or elaborate okay. as well? Okay, first, bliss, or the word, the Pali word is sukha, is the condition for samadhi or consciousness uh, or concentration. So this is actually based on a sequence that one finds mentioned in various places in the suttas, where we have first sometimes the development of faith, then from faith comes joy, from joy comes rapture, then from rapture comes tranquility, the sort of quieting down of the disturbed mental factors, then from that tranquility arises sukha, which is pleasure, happiness, or bliss. Then it is in that happy state of mind, or from that happy state of mind, that concentration as the deep samadhi arises. So that is why bliss or happiness is said to be the condition for concentration. Then 
the second question that you asked was, in what way is concentration or samadhi said to be inherent in all the wholesome actions? Yeah, and I think you mentioned that it sort of builds up over time. It doesn't come up out of nowhere. And you, yeah. you mentioned that in many wholesome consciousnesses, there's a, a bit of samadhi there. Yeah, so... Well, I said according to the Abhidharma system, in any kind of wholesome consciousness, there's some degree of... It's not a deep meditative samadhi, but it's a one-pointedness or a, a kind of stabilization of the mind, the steadiness of the mind, and that is seen to be the seed for the emergence of meditative samadhi, the concentration that comes in deep meditation. And so what one is doing, say, when one is meditating by focusing on, trying to focus on a single object, that one is repeatedly bringing the mind back to that object. And so that constant bringing the mind back to the object is strengthening that factor of one-pointedness which is inherent in any wholesome state of mind. And then as that one-pointedness gains momentum, then it culminates in the state of meditative samadhi. Does that make that clear? Thank you. I'm just wondering, does any of this apply to when we're in Wait, vivid... Uh, oh, uh, please stand up. Yeah, there. I'm just wondering if any of this applies to when we're in and vivid please, dream uh, states. Say again? When we're in vivid dream states, when we're dreaming, you know... Okay, vivid dream states. Yeah, does that, any of this apply to that? When it's almost like real, like it's happening, it's like if we're awake and... Is there any way? I guess there would be a way to explain vivid dream states, but... <laughs> doesn't apply to this. <laughs> to use the system of, of states of consciousness to explain. I don't know how to, exactly how to do it. Okay. Just curious. Okay, please. Yeah, over here. I think it's on. Oh, okay. Thank you, Bonte. Um, my question is that, uh, could you uh, maybe um, elaborate a little bit on the difference between the um, applied thought mounting, applied thought um, volitional formation, and um, I think there's one that's, that comes later, which is attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to say that the descriptions of them seem very, very similar. So let me just explain my understanding. Though I do have to confess that often the two seem to converge in ways that make it rather difficult to distinguish between them. But, as I said, manasikara, attention here, is the factor responsible for initially turning the mind to an object. Vitaka, like, once the mind has turned to that object, then vitaka, applied thought, is what is responsible for applying the mind to the object or mounting the mind onto the object. I don't know if that makes good sense, but this is the way the two definitions of, of the states. And I remember there was an essay on that particular point there's a book called A Compendium of Philosophy, which is actually an early translation of the Abhidhamata Sangaha, done by, I think, by a Burmese scholar back in the 1920s, 1930s. And then it had an appendix in which the editor of that translation, this was Mrs. Rhys Davids, one of the early British Pali scholars, 
she directed, wrote a number of naughty questions to the Burmese Abhidhamma master, Lady Soyadur. Um, and one of those questions was, what is the difference between attention and applied thought? <laughs> I would have to go to a library and check out and try to find that compendium of philosophy to see Lady Soyador's response to that. It's not fresh in my mind. But it's, as I said, it's a somewhat naughty question or problem. Okay, I think it's time now for us to take, we could take like a five minute break and then we can move to the meditation section. Let us say everybody should be there by 425.